selection problem is you are given these activities think of them as lectures for example and you are given one room and you would like to schedule as many activities as possible in that room such that of course they do not uh, conflict with each other so each activity has a start time and a finish time so S here stands for start and F for finish so this activity starts at time 2 it finishes at time 3 this starts at time 2 it finishes at time 5 and so forth with these start times and finish times some of these activities are uh, co conflicting they com uh, conflict with each other and some of them are compatible they can be scheduled in the same room so the question is we need to find a, a maximal set of activities that do not conflict with each other uh, that we can schedule uh, in the same room okay uh, of course you know the a brute force solution uh, what would be a brute force solution to this problem what's that to take an activity and compare with all other activities and check whether there is a could that be sufficient so I take an activity and compare it with all other activities mm -hmm. some of them will be conflicting some of them will not be conflicting but will this give me a complete solution this will just tell me what conflicts with this activity it will not tell me um, it will not tell me the whether they are conflicting or not in fact a brute force here would be to just look at all possible combinations and what are all possible combinations what are the combinations in this context hmm? what is a combination here it's a, s a set of activities right so a combination is a set of activities so we would consider all possible subsets and we have seen in the previous in previous lectures that Considering all possible subsets would give what kind of algorithm? Two power n. Two power n. Yeah, exponential. So because we would, we would have to consider all possible subsets. So obviously that's uh, too inefficient. <coughs> and we would like to find a solution that's better. So that's why you know, we are looking for a greedy solution uh, or a greedy algorithm for solving uh, this problem. So can you suggest a greedy algorithm based on one criterion? You know, greedy means we construct the solution by making a sequence of choices or decisions. So in, in the first step, we select one activity based on a certain uh, criterion or based on a certain uh, scheme. And then in the next step, we select the second activity and the third activity and the fourth activity and so forth. So at each step, we select one activity based on a certain uh, criterion. So now can you propose a criterion for selecting an activity? Yes. Um, can we say that uh, short activities cannot conflict with uh, others? So if the time period between them is short, so it is a possibility that it won't get conflicted with other activities. Okay, so you are suggesting that we select the activity with the, uh, with the shortest duration. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, let's, let's try this. Uh, okay, let's try this. So let's calculate the duration then for each one. If we calculate the duration here, we will get this has a duration of 1, duration of 3, 7 minus 4 is 3, 8 minus 1 is 7, 9 minus 5 is 4, 10 minus 8 is 2, 11 minus 9 is 2, 14 minus 11 is 3, and 16 minus 13 is 3. So these are the durations. So according to this scheme, we will first select which activity? Number 1. This has the shortest duration. So here our greedy strategy Our greedy strategy is select the activity with the minimum duration. 
Okay, so next we have this or this, six or seven. So we'll just, in, uh, you know, with minimum duration, some activities, we may have some ties. You know, some activities may have the same duration. So in this case, we will select one of them arbitrarily. So here, let's say that we select this. Does it conflict with one? No, it does not conflict with one. So we can take it. Then we look at the next uh, activity with the minimum duration, which is this. Now, does it conflict with what we have taken? Yes, yes. yes it does, because seven conflicts with six, so we cannot take it. Then we look at the duration. We have four activities with the same duration. So let's, let's select in, in the original order. So let's consider this first. Can we take this? We cannot take it because it conflicts with one. Can we take this? Yes. Yeah, so it's four, seven. It does not conflict with one, and it does not conflict with six either, so we can take it. And uh, the next is going to be this. Can we take this? Yes. yes, we can take it. It does not conflict. Then this, we cannot take it because nine conflicts with eight. Then the next duration is going to be uh, five. Can we take it? No. no. It conflicts with three, so we cannot take it. This has a duration of seven. It obviously conflicts with many other activities, so we cannot take it. So our greedy solution here, our greedy solution is uh, activity one, activity three, activity six, activity eight. How do we know if it's optimal or not? Well, at this point, we don't know, but I will tell you that this is optimal. You can't find more than four here. So we will discover this and we will prove it that we cannot find more than four. So this greedy solution is optimal. Greedy solution, which is optimal. But which, uh, which is optimal for this instance. Now, do you think that this will be optimal for all instances? Okay, so I can help you. This is not optimal for all instances. You can find an instance, uh, you can construct an instance for which this will fail. Think of an instance with three activities. Give me an instance with three activities for which this greedy algorithm will fail. Between 2 to 16. Okay. So 2 to 16. And? Then we can take okay. two, four. 2 to 4. Yeah, 2 to 4. And? And uh, five, 5 to 9. 5 to 9. Okay. Why does this uh, break this algorithm? Because the next, uh, the 2. So what's the, what are the durations here? The durations here are, this is... Uh, this is 14, 2, this is 4. So the minimum duration is going to be this. 2 and 4. Okay. So why does this... Okay, so I don't think that this... Yeah. So can you think of another example? Yeah, 3... Uh, three uh, a three event example, a three activity example, yes. So if you do noon to three, two to four. Okay, so give me the, the okay, S I F I, okay. Let's do them all at the same time. Okay, give me the numbers. Noon to three. Okay, so 12 to three. Um, and then two to four. Two to four. And uh, three to seven. And three to seven. So what's uh, so he, this is uh, okay. So yeah, okay. So this is this. We shouldn't put three here. So we should let's do it. 
you know, 24 hour system. So <laughs> it, you're, you're complicating. So give me small numbers. You know, you don't have to go noon and afternoon and all of that. So this complicates things unnecessarily. Just give me small numbers. Uh, one, okay, one, to, wait, wait, one to four. So give me, first of all, before you give me the numbers, give me the point. What's the point? Well, the point is the smallest one could overlap two larger ones. Exactly. So that's the point. Yes. So that's correct. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So the point is the minimum duration fails because you can have a small, an, uh, an activity with a small duration that conflicts with two others. So then, given this, we can design an example. So, for example, uh, you know, we can choose um, mm, two to four with a duration of two. Then, uh, two to four uh, conflicts with, um, you know, one to, uh, well, two is not, b because let's put it in the middle so that, uh, you know, it, it can we have more room. So four to six, okay, so this has a duration of two. Then this conflicts with uh, one to five and five to uh, 100, 1,000, whatever, infinity. So as a large number, uh, five to 10, okay? So now this has a duration of two and this has a duration of four, this has a duration of five. So if you pick the minimum duration, this will not be a good choice because this is in the middle and it conflicts with 1 to 5 and uh, with 5 to 10. So it's like this is 4 to 6 and then you have this is 1 to 5 and this is 5 to 10. So a minimum duration that conflicts with two others is not going to give an optimal solution because the minimum duration here, the greedy algorithm, greedy algorithm will give, or greedy solution, greedy solution is going to be what? Activity two. Uh, one, two, three. Activity one by itself. While the optimal solution is what? Two and three. So here, just you know, one small counter example uh, was, will uh, prove that this greedy algorithm is not optimal. It doesn't give an optimal solution for all instances. Uh, okay. So in fact, uh, you know, I have been teaching this for nine years, and every time I ask the students to come up with a greedy strategy for this problem, one student will suggest the minimum duration, uh, the minimum duration greedy strategy. So it has, this has been consistent, you know, for nine years, uh, 18 semesters. So uh, it looks like, you know, the minimum duration is the most intuitive, uh, the most intuitive uh, idea or uh, a technique that would uh, come the, to, to people's minds first, but then people forget that Minimum duration, even though an, an interval can be uh, small, but it can have uh, many conflicts. So now, given this, can you think of another greedy scheme or greedy uh, strategy for solving this problem? Yeah. Soon as deadline first? Oh, it's not a deadline here. So it's, uh, yeah, we call it the finish time. First yeah. activity first. <laughs> first activity first? You mean, oh, the, the activity that starts first? Well, that's what he's saying. Yeah, the activity that starts first, you do first. No, the end okay. or the ends first. Or well, the one that ends first or the one that starts first? Starts <laughs> first. Yeah, the one that ends first. So obviously, so if I claim that the activity that starts first is the best greedy algorithm, this would be very easy to... Just get a long activity. Huh? Just have a really long one that starts first. Exactly. So the counter example for the uh, earliest start is just an activity that starts at one and ends at the end of the whole period. And then it, it's going to conflict with all other activities. So that's very easy to uh, disprove. But the activity that ends first. So this is the greedy algorithm that in fact works. And this is something that we will prove. But let's see if we can, let's see how we can apply this first to, the, to this example. 
then so this is a you know th this is the uh, this is a counter example for for the minimum duration for the minimum duration <coughs> strategy now <coughs> if we look at the greedy strategy of select the activity with with the minimum finish time with minimum finish time so in this case in fact they are already ordered by finish time so we just go through them in order in this case we are going to select activity number one then number one conflicts with two so we cannot take two because it conflicts with one then three does not conflict with one so we will take it then four uh, does it conflict yeah it conflicts so we cannot take it five yes we can five can we take it yeah no 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 we cannot, we cannot. We cannot. Because we cannot take five yeah because we have taken four and seven so four and seven conflicts with this that starts with four so we cannot take this uh, then but we can take eight and ten right then this conflicts and this does not conflict does not conflict and this conflicts <coughs> so in fact we will end up with the same solution by the way is the optimal solution here unique So give me another optimal solution, another, another optimal solution. Uh, two to five. What's the okay? Another optimal solution. What's that? Uh, a two. A two. A five. Five nine is a five. Okay. Uh, nine to eleven. Two five nine. Uh, no no, just give me the numbers. Oh sorry. Two, five nine seven. Yeah, seven. Seven A nine is A seven. Two five seven. Eight, nine. Eight and eight. Eight. No. So give me activity numbers. <laughs> numbers of activities. Not start time and finish time. Two. Okay. A two. Uh, five. A five. Uh, seven. A seven. Mm -hmm. A two. Yeah, seven. A seven. Five seven. And uh, eight. A eight. Okay. So this uh, this starts with two. So two five. Uh, then uh, activity number five, which is five and nine. Yes, does not conflict. And then seven nine. does not conflict. And eight. Yeah. So this is another optimal solution. So generally speaking, in uh, optimization problems, the optimal solution is not unique there may be multiple optimal solutions and in this case we have shown that there are at least two optimal solutions there could be more I think there are more here there are more uh, more than two optimal solutions so the optimal solution is not unique uh, okay so now this is our solution with the minimum finish time now since we have uh, we have talked about you know minimum duration did not work we talked about minimum start time did not work minimum finish time it works but we haven't proven that it works now if minimum finish time works using symmetry can you suggest a, a greedy strategy that will work given that minimum finish time works can you think of a greedy strategy using symmetry of a greedy strategy that will work as well okay so let's try to think intuitively first why minimum finish time works minimum finish time works because this is the duration that we have the whole period that we are scheduling over if we select the activity that 
finishes first. The activity that finishes first. Here. What does it mean? It means that it will leave the longest possible period of time free for scheduling other activities. So by making the finish time of our first choice as early as possible, we are leaving the longest possible period of time free and available for scheduling other activities. So that's why. So we are uh, we're sure that all of this period is now available. So that's why minimum finish time works. We will give an, a clearer argument later. But given that this works, what, what else does the same thing? But looking at the problem from the different, in a different direction. So if you, if you do the earliest finish time, you will get this. And if you do what? What if you do the latest start time? So if you do the latest start time, you are the closest to the end line. So this is the start line. This is start and this is end. Right? So you can think of it uh, with... Uh, symmetry or you just traverse the, the the direction you think of it in the other direction so here you start from the start line and you would like your first choice to be as close as possible to the start line or you want to be you want it to be as close as possible to the end line or you want to look from the end line this is the closest to the end line so this is the latest start Right, so minimum finish time or latest, well, it's, it's latest start time, we'll do the same thing. Okay, so now, uh, okay, so let's now, f you know, before we give a, we give a proof to this, uh, let's write the code. Let's write the code for this uh, algorithm and see how easy the, the code is. Uh, it's, you know, for greedy algorithms, the code will be easy most of the time. <coughs> okay. Okay, so the greedy activity selection and we'll have uh, S, F, and N where S, what is S? array of start times and F is an array of finish times and N is the number of activities okay so given this, you know, the, the first thing that we would do in this algorithm is what? Sort. Yeah, sorting them. Sort <coughs> activities in both arrays. Uh, sort them by finish time. in ascending or descending order ascending because we are interested in the minimum finish time in ascending order okay then then what should we do
So how did we construct this solution? We took the activity with the minimum finish time. So the first activity after sorting is going to be in the solution. So A uh, equals A union activity uh, A or yeah, let's use different notation. Uh, Okay, add A of 0 to the solution set A. The solution set A. <coughs> then, for I equals, for I equals 1, to n minus 1, what do we do? So now the arrays are sorted. How, do we, how did we construct this? So we took the first activity. Then we decided not to take this based on what? How do we check the conflict? What are the numbers that we compare? Start time is the same, no. What defines a conflict? Or what defines no conflict? What's the condition for no conflict? Time. Start time is greater than end time. Start time for the next activity should be greater than or equal to the end time. Okay? So in this case, if start time of I is greater than or equal finish time of I minus one. I minus one. Okay. I minus 1 is wrong. Why? So I wrote I minus 1, but it's wrong. Why? Because it will just take from the next. Yeah. It will not. The solution set. We have to take the last. I'm sorry. Yes, say that. We have to take the last activity from the solution set. Yeah, exactly. So I, have, I, I, I will not necessarily look at the last activity, the activity that came be before this, because I minus 1 may not have been taken in the solution set. I minus 1 will not necessarily be in the solution set. I want to check with the last activity in the solution set. So in order to, uh, to know that, I need to track the number of the last activity in the solution set. So let me call this k. And the initial value of k is 0. So now, f of r, s of i is greater than or equal f of k. Then add A of I to A. So A is the solution set. A is the solution set. In fact, I can just say A here. So instead of calling it to A, where A is the solution set. And then? Update k. Yeah, exactly. I need to update k. k equals what? i. i. k equals i. And in fact, that's it. That's all what I need to do. So I just sort them by minimum finish time, by finish time. Then the first one will always be there, will always be in the solution. I, I, you know, I'm guaranteed to have at least one activity, right, in the solution. The solution will never have zero activities. So it's going to be A of zero. Then I go through the other activities and check if their start time is greater than or equal to the finish time of the last taken activity. So K is index of last taken activity in A. So add it to the solution set and then set K to I. Yeah. What if more than one activity have the start time uh, same as the finish time of the one in the solution set? What if more than one activity are what? Have the start time equal to the SI that is the last finish time of the end the solution set. Uh, we'll check, we'll take only, we'll 
this is considering only the first activity that matches, that is greater than the finish time of the last time. Yes. Uh, if more than one activity is held, the start time same. More than one activity does not conflict, we'll take them all. So what's the problem? So if, so we are considering the activities in the order of finish time, like we are doing here. So and we are comparing with the fin finish time of the last taken activity. Yeah, so if it does not conflict, we take it. Okay, so um, as in this example, we are having two, three. Now, these? Yeah, uh, first we are taking the uh, first activity, that is having start time two and finish time three. Yes. Uh, if, uh, then we are taking four and seven, right? If uh, there is one more activity that starts at 4, but ends at like 5. There could be a range before 4 and 7. Just sort yeah. Okay, you have, have sorted, sorted the Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, if, if there is an activity that starts at 4 and finishes at 5, yeah, we then it will be before 3, because we have sorted them. So now we, the point here is that we only need to compare with the finish time of the last taken activities because the fi finish time of the last taken activity is guaranteed to be the greatest finish time in the set of taken activities, right? Because they are ordered in finish time. So, okay. So, any, any questions or any, yes? Well, since your array is one index, you should, should we loop to n? Is it n minus one? It, well, we're starting from zero, from zero to n minus one. Because we're starting from zero. You can start from one. It's not a big deal. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, in fact, in algorithms books, they normally start from one, not from zero. But we, we ch you know, I chose to just start from zero consistently in all algorithms. But it's not a big deal. You can start from one. Okay. Uh, yes. We are checking the uh, start time of the first and the uh, end time of the taken one, right? So, what if uh, instead of 316, 1316, it was uh, 1314? 1314? Yeah. yeah. So, if it, it has just one hour, right? If this is 1314? Yeah, so it will come ahead. Yeah. So, if 13, 14, then one of these will be before the, not necessarily, we will be sorting them by finish time, so it could be 8 before 9 or 9 before 8. So we'll take, obviously we'll take one of them. The duration doesn't matter anymore, we're not talking about duration. Okay, alright, so this is the algorithm, now what's the... Uh, you know, once we prove this, the algorithm itself is very easy. And even the analysis is very easy. So what's the running time of this? N log n. Yeah, so it's n log n for the sorting. So the sorting is theta of n log n. And then this loop is theta of n. Why is it theta of n? We are traversing it only once. Is no, this is not sufficient. So to, to argue that this is theta of n, it's, it doesn't suffice to say that we are traversing the array only once. Yeah. The internal of the array is all constant. The internal of the loop. The loop yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, the body of the loop is, takes constant time. So the body of the loop is not something that is dependent on the input size. The body of the loop is constant. So that's why it's theta of n. Okay, so total time is is theta of n log n. Easy. Okay, so now we need to prove that this works all the time. We need to prove that this thing works all the time. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, we have to prove this in general, right? In order to prove that this will work all the time, we have to come up with a general argument. And the general argument 
considers an optimal solution an optimal solution <coughs> that is equal to that consists of O1, O2, O3, OM or uh, yeah well given a set of activities S equals um, A1, A2, through An. So given a set of activities A1, A2, A3, An, let's assume that we have an optimal solution O1, O2, O3, OM. Now, this is a general optimal solution, right? <coughs> so this can be anything. Now, let's assume, without any loss of generality, that the activities are ordered in minimum finish time in both S and S op. Assume that the activities in both S and S opt are ordered uh, by finish time uh, or in a uh, are ordered by finish time in ascending order. or are in ascending are in uh, increasing or non-decreasing non-decreasing finish time order Now, did we lose any generality when we make this assumption? D does this assumption make us lose generality? Why or why not? So we just, we did not lose any generality by making this assumption because this is the set of activities. We just ordered them. We can order them any way we want. We haven't yet s said anything about optimality. And here is an optimal solution. So we know that an optimal solution exists. There is at least one optimal solution. And we just looked at this optimal solution and we ordered the activities in this optimal solution by finish time in uh, increasing or non-decreasing finish time order. So we did not say that O1 and A1 are equal. So O1 and A1 are not necessarily equal. O1 and A1 are not necessarily equal. So, we are given an optimal solution in which that starts with activity O1 and O1 is not necessarily A1. Now, if O1 equals A1, then we do not have we have nothing to prove in fact because we are trying to we are trying to prove that there is always an optimal solution that starts with the activity with minimum finish time that starts with the greedy choice which is the activity with the minimum finish time so this is opt may or may not start with the activity with minimum finish time it may or may not start with a1 so if, if O1 equals A1, we are done. Or we are done proving that there exists an optimal solution that starts with the activity with minimum finish time. This is what we mean. So then 
This is what we are trying to prove, that there exists an optimal solution that starts with the activity with minimum finish time. Now, if R1 is not equal to A1, we can replace O1 with A1 and still get a valid solution. Why? So this is an optimal solution that starts with O1, but if O1 is not necessarily the activity with the minimum finish time. So it's like this solution. Here, <coughs> uh, you know, we have a solution that starts, for example, with 2. So we have a solution that starts with A2, uh, A5, A7, A8. So here, your optimal solutions that do not start with a minimum f uh, finish time do exist. But what we are trying to prove is that even if the optimal solution does not start with the activity with the minimum finish time, we can replace it with an optimal solution that starts with the activity with minimum finish time. So we can just take this O1 and replace it with O1. We can replace O1 with A1 and get S opt prime, which is A1, O2, O3, OM. Now S opt prime, S opt prime is a valid solution. Why? This is the whole point. Because K1 is the, it, it has the uh, smallest finish time, so it will never uh, in, um, get overlap with any other activity in the future. Yeah, it will not overlap with O2, O3, because we know that if the solution starts with O1, then O1 does not conflict with O2, O3, OM. So we know that, you know, given, well, since, or we know that, that the start time, or, uh, yeah, start time of OI is greater than or equal to the finish time of O1 for I equals 2, 3 to M. So for all of these activities, O2, O3 through OM, we know that their start time is greater than or equal to the finish time of O1, right? So they do not conflict with O1. But if they do not conflict with O1, necessarily they will not conflict with A1. Because A1 is even better, right? So A1 here, so in, in, in this example, this is our O1, and this is our A1. <coughs> so O1 ends with 5. Since O1 is an optimal solution, so everything else is going to start at 5 or later. If everything else is going to start at 5 or later, it will necessarily, it will not conflict with A1, which is even better than O1. It ends at 3. So it cannot conflict with A1. So we know that SOI is greater than o, uh, of uh, FO1 for I equals to uh, this implies that or since the finish time of A1 is less than or equal the finish time of O1, SOI, so the finish time of A1 is less than or equal to the finish time of O1, then we know that SOI is greater than or equal F 
a1 for i equals 2, 3 through m. OK, so the whole point is that you know, if you have an optimal solution that starts with O1, you can always replace it with an optimal solution that starts with A1, which is the activity with the minimum finish time. Well, what does this prove? This proves that there always exists an optimal solution that starts with the greedy choice. What's the greedy choice in this case? The activity with the minimum finish time. Greedy choice in this context is activity with minimum finish time. So we have proven that there always exists a solution that starts with the activity with the minimum finish time. So if you give me a, an optimal solution that does not start with the activity with the minimum finish time, I'm going to replace it with one that starts with the activity with minimum finish time. So this proves what we call the greedy choice property. Greedy choice property okay but is this enough so we have only proven that the first we can safely put the activity with the minimum finish time we can put it as the first activity in the solution but we haven't proven we haven't shown how to construct the rest of the solution now in fact showing how to construct the rest of the solution is going to be based on an inductive argument. So the greedy choice is basically the base of the inductive argument. Then we'll have to show that we can repeat the same thing over and over and over for the remaining subproblem. So for uh, the remaining subproblem, which is finding the remaining items or the remaining activities, the point is we can apply to the sub-problem what we apply to the original problem. So we can repeat the same thing. So by looking at the remaining sub-problem, what's the remaining sub-problem? The problem of scheduling the remaining activities in the remaining time duration. Now, we can argue that an optimal solution to a complete problem must consist of an optimal solution to this subproblem. So, of course, this does not apply to all optimization problems. You know, an optimal solution to the big problem does not always consist of optimal solutions to the subproblems. This does not apply to every optimization problem, but it does apply to this a specific problem and in fact it applies to all the problems that can be solved using greedy algorithms. So if we prove that uh, the optimal solution to the big problem must consist of an optimal solution to this subproblem, then that means that we can solve this subproblem separately. So we can take the subproblem separately and we can solve it the same way we solved the original problem. But doing that separately, we can repeat the same thing. So now our subproblem is O2, O3, O, OM. Then we can now you know, isolate O2 as a greedy choice and solve this remaining subproblem. Then we can take this as the greedy choice and then uh, solve the remaining subproblem and so forth until uh, we end up with uh, nothing remaining. Okay? So, so what we have proven so far is the greedy choice property. What we need to prove is the 
what we call the optimal substructure. That if this is your, <coughs> this is your big problem, and you have decided that the first item in it is A1, then I can solve this problem, we call it the remaining subproblem, I can solve this separately. Now how do you argue that the optimal solution to the big problem must consist of an optimal solution to the remaining subproblem? It cannot have a sub-optimal solution to this problem. Okay, well, it's, we can prove this by using what we call a cut and paste argument, where we say that, okay, let's prove this by contradiction. Assume that this remaining subproblem has a better solution. Suppose that this remaining subproblem has a better solution than its solution in the big problem. Then I can take that better solution and replace the solution in the optimal solution that I assume exists and get a solution better than optimal. Okay, again. So I'm saying that this is an optimal solution. So the point here is that, you know, in order to prove that this works all the time, you have to come up with a general argument. You have to come up with a general abstract argument that works all the time. You cannot rely on certain examples. Okay. So you are assuming that you have an optimal solution. The optimal solution consists of the first activity and then the remaining activities. Now, what we are trying to prove is that we can solve the problem of finding the remaining activi activities separately. We can solve it as a separate problem. Why? Because if we had a better solution for it, for this remaining subproblem, we can stick it here in the optimal solution and get an even better solution than the optimal solution. So assuming for the sake of reaching a contradiction that this is an optimal solution that consists of a suboptimal solution to, these, to this remaining subproblem, if you can find an optimal solution to the remaining subproblem and replace this with it, you will get a solution that is better than the optimal solution, which is a contradiction. Okay, so this this is possible in this problem because what is the remaining subproblem? The remaining subproblem is looking at the activities whose start time, all the activities, the set of activities S remaining, <coughs> is the set of activities AI such that SI is greater than or equal to F1. The activities whose start times are greater than or equal to F1, to the finish time of the first activity. Okay? So, does this make sense? Any questions on this? Again, you know, well, explaining the Usually explaining the algorithm and how it works and the code is much easier than the, the proof of correctness. And that's why, you know, that, that's what makes greedy algorithms, uh, that's the challenge in, in greedy algorithms, is to prove that uh, they work all the time, that this algorithm works all the time for any instance. So let's, uh, you know, let's tr try to write the proof to the, uh, the optimal substructure. Okay. Okay, now, after proving 
after proving the greedy choice property we know that there is an optimal solution that starts with the greedy choice. So let that solution be um, S opt equals A1 O1 sorry O2 O3 OM where the finish time, the start time of OI is greater than or equal to the finish time of A1 for I equals 2, 3, 4 to M. So basically it's finding the remaining activities to add. Now, the sub-problem, let uh, S sub be the sub-problem of finding the optimal solution for activities uh, AI such that SI is greater than or equal to F1. For all the activities that do not conflict with A1. Now, now S opt must consist of A1 and the optimal solution or an optimal solution and an optimal solution for an optimal solution for, for S sub. Okay, so the, the proof here is proof by contradiction assume that Uh, assume that S sub has a better solution than its solution in S opt. If S sub has a better solution than its solution in S opt, then I can or we can concatenate this solution with A1 and get a solution S opt star that is better than S opt, which is a contradiction.
Now, why can we do the concatenation? So, so the idea here is why can we do the concatenation? Because all the activities here, by definition, have start times that are greater than or equal to F1. So any activity that belongs to this set is going to be compatible with, uh, with, A, with A1. Okay. So now what does this all mean? It means that we can always start the solution with the greedy choice. We can always start the solution with the activity with the minimum finish time. Then we can repeat the same thing over and over and over. So for, for the remaining subproblem, we can do the same thing. Uh, so here's the big problem. I can start with the greedy choice which is A1, then I can look at the activities that do not conflict with A1 and select the best one of them and that's going to be the first activity in, uh, in the solution to the remaining sub-problem and so forth. So think of this as the greedy choice property being the base of the induction and the optimal substructure, so this is what we call optimal substructure, being the inductive step. Optimal substructure. That we can repeat the same thing. Okay, or that we can solve the remaining subproblem separately. And if we can solve the remaining subproblem separately, we can apply to it whatever we applied to the first problem. So the solution to the remaining subproblem will start with the activity with minimum finish time among the remaining activities. The remaining activities that do not conflict with, uh, with A1. So this is the set of these activities. Si such that Si is greater than or equal to F1. Okay, so now, any questions on this? Um, okay, so now how do we use a similar argument to prove the fractional knapsack problem? Well, the fractional knapsack is, gonna <coughs> is going to be easier because So let's just think about the fractional knapsack. Let's just think about the greedy choice By the way, uh, so the, the fractional knapsack is so intuitive that it doesn't need a formal argument. But I think the activity selection, you need a formal argument. It's not, it's not intuitive. It's, you know, selecting the activity with the minimum finish time appears to be good. But you need a proof that it, it's indeed good in all cases. That it's indeed something that you can do and it will work for all instances. So I think that the proof for the activity selection problem is necessary. But the proof for the fractional knapsack is is not necessary because it's it's very intuitive that you are filling you know the the knapsack with activities with uh, the most valuable activities so now applying a similar logic we assume that we have an optimal solution optimal solution that does not start that starts with item so it has uh, let's say item uh, I opt or let's call it O let's call it O1 so it, it has items O1, O2, O3 O4 or <coughs> OM so this is an optimal solution to the fractional knapsack that consists of, of items O1, O2, O3, OM. While the items uh, sorted in order of value are going to be 
a1, a2, a3, an. Now, the question is, what do we need to prove now? What do we need to argue? Well, wha well, first, let's start with the greedy choice property. What do we mean by the greedy choice property here? That we can start with the greedy choice, right? So O1 is not necessarily equal to A1. Now, in the fractional knapsack, the problem is different. If O1, well, O1 could be not equal to A1, but if the uh, V1 divided by W1, uh, or l let's call it V01, V01 divided by W of O1 is not equal to VA1 divided by WA1. Can this be true? Can this ever be true? Can we have a solution for the fractional knapsack problem that starts with an item that is not the greedy choice, that has no. greater than VA1 divided by WA1? No. Yes, the answer is no. Yes, the correct answer is no. In the fractional knapsack, the first item must be the greedy choice. But it has to be, but it, there could be multiple greedy choice. There could be multiple items with the same value per unit weight. So there could be multiple items, there could be a tie. There is a tie, but they, they should all have the best V by W, right? You cannot start with an item that is second in value per unit weight. Here, yes, we could. See here with the activity selection problem, we could start with an activity that doesn't finish first and still we could find an optimal solution. So for the activity selection, you can start with an item that is not the greedy choice and still find an optimal solution. But in the fractional knapsack, you must start with the greedy choice. Otherwise, you will not get an optimal solution and the proof is easy. Assuming that V01 divided by W01, that we are starting with an item that is not the greedy choice, then I can just <coughs> replace this item or part of it with A1. Now in replacement, what's the difficulty that will face me in the replacement? <coughs> in making an argument about the replacement, replacement here is not as easy as it was in the activity selection. Because, so replacement in the activity selection was very easy. Because you just take an item and uh, take an activity and replace it with another activity. With the fractional knapsack, what's the difficulty? We have to consider the yeah, we have to consider the weight. So the weight of A1 could be greater than or smaller than the weight of O1. But in all cases, like assume first that the weight of A1 is smaller than the weight of O1. Of course, if the weights are the same, then you just do a replacement easily. But if the weight of A1 is less than the weight of O1, so you just replace this part of O1, it's fractional, with <coughs> A1. What does this mean? You replace this with a more valuable item, so you got something better than optimal, which is a contradiction. So it contradicts the claim that this is that you can ever start with an item that is not the greedy choice. So if someone says that I can start with an item that is not a greedy choice, you can disprove this claim by saying, okay, I can take this part of it and replace it with A1 and get something better than optimal, which contradicts your claim that this is optimal. And if A1 is, <coughs> if A1 was, if the weight of A1 is greater than the weight of O1, what can I do in this case? <coughs> hmm? You know, just replace, just take part of A1. 
I don't have to take all of A1 to make the point. I, guess I just replace this whole thing with A1 or with the corresponding, with the, with, the, with the same weight of A1. And again, I will get something better than optimal. So here for the, for the fractional knapsack, if someone claims that they have an optimal solution that, star that does not start with the greedy choice, you can disprove it easily but with this replacement argument. You can say, I can replace it with a greedy choice and get something better than your optimal. Therefore, your optimal is not optimal. Or what you think is optimal is not really optimal. Okay, so do you see the difference between these two problems? Here, you must start with the greedy choice. Here, you do not have to start with the greedy choice. Uh, anyway, so... So I know that you know abstraction is always hard. You know, th so this is the hardest part with algorithms. Uh, you know, students always uh, you know find it hard to understand the abstraction. But luckily, in this course.